Welcome and hello um, to another session of Global Immunotalks. Uh, my name is Burkhard Becher. I'm at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And it is once again my pleasure to welcome you all to today's seminar webinar. Um, before we start and before I introduce our guests today, I, I would like to alert you to the fact that you could now vote and suggest speakers via Twitter. Um, the Twitter handle was at the very beginning of the webinar, but you could see it, and we will play it once again at the end of the webinar. So go there uh, and engage and, and tell us what you think about Global Immunotalks, but also uh, maybe suggest speakers and, and, and vote. Um, also, I'd like to alert you to next week, April 26, we have Paul Herzog as a speaker. But today, it is my particular pleasure to pre present our speaker, and that's uh, Dr. Shuti Naik, uh, who is an assistant professor at NYU uh, in New York, obviously, at the Grossman School of Medicine. Um, Shruti is originally from Pune in India, but she received her Bachelor in Cell and Molecular Biology and her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Now, the Pennsylvania and NIH had a partnership, the University of Pennsylvania and NIH had a partnership program for a PhD, and the mentorship was uh, uh, Yasmin Belkaid, uh, well known to uh, uh, all of us, I presume. Um, after her PhD, she did a postdoctoral fellowship at uh, Rockefeller University in the lab of, of Elaine Fuchs. And in uh, 2018, so only five years ago, uh, she started her independent group and um, and how what a start. So she does study the crosstalk between immune cells and the surrounding tissue during repair and infection, inflammation. She's made uh, a couple of incredible and fundamental discoveries on the on the mechanistic underpinnings on how tissues respond and remember uh, either com uh, commensal or pathogenic uh, insults or inflammatory stimuli. Um, in addition to her incredible science and very prolific lab, uh, Shuti is a very strong advocate for the increasing uh, for increasing diversity in science and promoting the advancement of underrepresented and marginalized groups. For this and for her science, she has been recognized uh, um, through numerous accolades, including the International Takeda Innovators and in Science Award, Pew Stewart Scholar, uh, the Packard Fellowship and uh, the NIH Director's Innovator Award. So all in all, um, a perfect uh, a speaker for Global New Talks. And as you all know, what we do at uh, the beginning of each seminar, we ask our speakers uh, a question. And the question that we would like to, uh, I would like to ask you, Shruti, is what is the trait in your personality that has helped you the most in your scientific career? So first of all, thank you so much for having me here. And, and actually thank you to you and all the organizers uh, for putting on this Global Immuno Talk series. Um, I think it's really a delight to realize that you're part of a global immunology community and that we are all one. So access is um, a barrier that you have taken away. So thank you. And I think uh, to, your, to address your question, and I'm also gonna share my screen at the same time to be efficient, um, I think that the the trait that has helped me the most is grit resilience um i think science is really hard life is really hard science is really hard um and uh, i think the thing you have to learn is that you have to keep going and sometimes you fail actually a lot of times you fail but you dust yourself off and just try again and so that's i think resilience is the one trait that i would keep coming back to as something that is really important to persevere um in life make discoveries and move forward. Um, and I'm just gonna oh, that's, this. That's great. Sorry, uh, I, 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 I totally agree. I appreciate what you're saying. I also would like to alert everyone about one of Shruti's little hobbies, which is she is actually explaining immunology uh, to lay people, to lay persons on YouTube. And I find, I, I watched them all and I thought they were amazing. So I, I think, uh, um, uh, we are very, very pleased to have you here today, Shruti, and I don't want to take any more time away from your seminar and go straight to you. Uh, see you at the end of your seminar again. Thanks for Awesome. For coming. Thank you again for that generous introduction and for hosting me here. Um, so as Burkert mentioned, um, I'm really interested in how immune cells talk to non-immune cells and tissues and what that means for our health, but we're really in the context of how that conversation helps 
our body understand environmental exposures. So, um, so we know that environmental exposures like your microbes, your nutrition, just your macro environment really dictate um, states of health and disease. And one admittedly biased perspective that my lab has that I've kind of recruited through my career um, is that these environmental inputs, which are often experienced in our barrier tissues, like the skin and the gut, um, influence of the conversation, are sensed uniquely by immune cells and influence the conversation between immune cells and the rest of the tissue. And this conversation is what mediates adaptation to these various inputs. And so that's the perspective and the framework within which I'm gonna essentially talk to you about the discoveries that I, I've made along with my collaborators and my wonderful mentors over the course of my uh, training and independent career. Um, so it all really started when, um, as Burke had mentioned, I joined the lab of Yasmin Belkade at the NIH to understand how commensal microbes influence um, tissues and influence immune function. Um, and at the time, the field was, you know, just this concept that we were teeming in commensals and this veritable garden of bacteria and, and other microbes were living in and on our bodies was really coming into focus with um, the advent of sequencing technologies. But at the time, the field was largely focused on the gut microbiota um, and the function the gut microbiota played in various, um, sort of facets of physiology and immunology. And other commensal niches like the skin were, were largely well described, but not functionally studied. And so, you know, starting out, we just had this pretty simple question, which is do commensal communities outside the gut, like the skin contribute to host immunity? And if so, how? And so to address this, we used our favorite tool, germ-free mice, these mice lack all um, living exogenous microbes um, on their skin, on their gut, everywhere in their body. And we devised a pretty simple experiment, which was we said, you know, let's associate these mice with either a skin tropic bacteria, in this case, Staph epidermidis, which is on all our skin, um, or a gut tropic bacteria, segmented filamentous bacteria, which has been described by Dr. Dan Lippman and many other groups now. Um, and, and just ask, what happens to immunity in the skin and the gut? Really asking this question of, can a gut tropic bacteria distally uh, affect skin immunity and can a skin tropic bacteria have any influence at all? And at the time we knew that in the absence of commensals, germ-free mice had a defect in intestinal Th17 cells. And we had also found that these mice had an infect, uh, had a defect in skin Th17 cells. Um, so we associated the gut tropic SFB, and, and as Dr. Lippman had shown, we were able to rescue levels of intestinal IL-17, uh, but not in the skin. Um, so if you gave the skin tropic drug, there was no effect in the gut. But if you gave the gut tropic drug, there was an effect in the gut. And then if you gave Staph Epi, you were able to now rescue in the skin conversely, uh, but you weren't able to rescue in the skin with SFB. So what that really told us is that commensals are acting quite locally in homeostasis and directly modulating immunity in the underlying tissue, whereby a bacteria that lives on your skin is influencing what's going on in your skin and, and augmenting your barrier function and maybe building resilience, which we'll talk about our favorite word. Um, and, and similarly, commensals in the gut are locally modulating uh, the milieu of immune cells and 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 directing homeostatic responses in that context. And so that really opened up this notion to thinking about commensals living on our various barriers, uh, not just our skin and our gut, but what the commensals in the oral cavity do and their genital cavity and the respiratory tract, um, and, and how are they uniquely contributing to um, immune surveillance and homeostatic immunity in these different barrier tissues. So this was quite exciting. Um, and then, you know, we sort of thought about, okay, well that we were using model commensals and understanding sort of proof of concepts, how these commensals were interacting with different barriers. But the question that, that really sort of left us um, 
sort of curious is like, why do you have so many different types of microbes? And the skin in particular houses one of the most uh, diverse microbial communities in the body uh, in a large part because it is such a big heterogeneous organ. No one skin site looks exactly like another. And there are moist sites and there are oily sites and there are dry sites in the skin. And each of these have their own unique microcosms of bacteria. And so, so we wanted to know, do different bacteria have different functions in eliciting um, immune function? And, and so at the time, this wasn't, again, super well understood. Um, and we also realized pretty early on that if we wanted to do the study, germ-free mice were gonna be really, really hard to use because they have to be kept in independent isolators and um, they're super expensive. And so we decided that instead of doing a loss of function system with the germ-free mice, we would develop a new system, a gain of function system, where we would just try to associate skin bacteria onto SPF mice in our vivarium facilities and develop a model of commensalism. Um, and surprisingly, our SPF mice, our specific pathogen-free mice that are in all our vivariums, were quite receptive to topically applying commensals. And they really fulfill this model of commensalism, which is even when you topically applied, you didn't have inflammation, um, the commensals persisted long-term, so 180 days out, um, and they really formed this sort of um, pleasant homeostatic relationship, commensal relationship uh, with their hosts. Now we had a system where we could start screening through a lot of different classes of microbes and types of microbes. And so we started by looking at the sort of three major classes of microbes that are on our skin and also included staph xylosis, which is really abundant in, in mouse skin in many colonies. And what we found is that all of these different types of bacteria could induce um, either homeostatic Th17 cells or gamma delta cells. But Staphylococcus, and in particular, certain strains of Staphylococcus, were able to uniquely induce a population of TC17 cells that hung out in the skin. And this was really, really exciting because these cells uh, had been previously described in human skin, uh, but were never really found in 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 mouse skin. And so, uh, what we realized was that some of these sort of populations that are unique to human skin um, are, in fact, there because they have the right commensal signal and that our SPF colonies were absent of these commensal signals. And so it's not that mice didn't have these cells, but they didn't have the correct signal to develop these cells. And by sort of creating this humanized environment, we were able to recapitulate what these cells were. These commensal associated cells hung around long-term. So you could see them 180 days after association, albeit in the presence of the commensal. Um, and we also knew that these cells were really important to understand because they play a key role in the pathogenesis of psoriasis and squamous cell carcinoma and likely other um, cutaneous pathologies. Um, so this was kind of the one of the first times where uh, folks had looked at induction of, of commensal specific responses in, um, in, in the context of TC17 cells. And so we wanted to understand, like, how do you go from putting a commensal on your skin to generating this new cell type? Um, and so, of course, the intermediary there would be a dendritic cell. And so what we realized is that actually multiple dendritic cells cooperate to have this uh, response when you have an intact barrier and you're really uh, topically applying commensals. Um, so, First, you needed CD103 DCs to migrate to the lymph node and induce the response. And, and you could see that in the absence of CD103 DCs, which if you look at BATF3 knockout mice, they lose these, you did not generate this TC17 response to commensals. And you also needed dermal dendritic cells to locally produce IL-1 beta to, to sort of maintain uh, the ability of these of these TC17s to make IL-17 and maintain their functionality. And, and, and finally, why generate? Why does the body go through so much effort to generate these cells and keep them at our barriers? It became pretty clear that it was because it was boosting um, barrier responses and allowing for heterologous protection against invading pathogens. So, um, you know, if you gave our mice that had staph epi, um, candida, you saw that the barrier was enhanced and antimicrobial function was enhanced in a manner that limited the penetration of the, the 
the fungal pathogen Candida albicans and establishment inflammation. And commensals were acting potentially as natural adjuvants for chronic infections. So Leishmania major, which is this you know, stealthy parasite that hangs out and doesn't really have a lot of immune stimulatory components, um, was, was really blooming in the absence of commensals. And so commensal signals may act as natural adjuvants to let the immune system know that there's an invader here. But I think more importantly, um, this kind of established this paradigm that it, the manner in which commensals control um, pathogens is not just via a direct inhibition um, by secreting antimicrobials or by sec by sort of occupying niches and, and through sort of niche competition, but by inducing effective, enduring, durable long-term immune responses. And this is really the adaptation that the host has had is to learn from commensals and sustain these responses to commensals that now serve as a heterologous barrier uh, protecting us from pathogens. And so at the end of this, it became really clear that our experiences, whether they're commensal um, or pathogenic, have some long-term consequences on our tissues. Um, and I got really interested in what these enduring consequences were. And so I joined the lab of Elaine Fuchs and really partnered with a fantastic postdoctoral, or fantastic graduate student who's now a postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Samantha Larson, um, to start thinking about what are the enduring consequences of, of, um, of inflammation of our environmental encounters on uh, tissues and on cells outside the immune system. So everyone in the audience has had a cut, a scrape before, potentially a sunburn, been exposed to maybe an infection in the skin or elsewhere. And we know as immunologists that this results in the generation of immunological memory. This is in fact the basis of every vaccination um, and, 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 and androgen specific memory is really crucial to protect from secondary responses. Um, but, but Sam and I were really interested in understanding well, what about other cells of the tissue? Um, can they remember? Um, and what are the long-term consequences of these inflammatory stressors, these environmental exposures for the tissue? So when you think about long-term consequences, implicit in that question was really this fact that we had to look at cells that stuck around long-term or long-lived cells of the tissue. And the, some of the longest-lived cells of the tissue are um, adult stem and progenitor cells. So just a primer, because I know we're an immunology audience. Adult stem cells and progenitors are these remarkable cells that have the ability to um, sense and adapt to whatever the tissue needs. They are found in most of our body's tissues or have been found in most of our body's tissues. Um, and they exquisitely are tuned to the needs of the tissue. Uh, for instance, you have tissues with low or no turnover, like the muscle of the brain, where stem cells really only come into action when there's damage. And then you have tissues with rapid turnover, like our blood system, our intestinal epithelia, our epidermis, in which stem cells are constantly producing tissue because of the need of, of that organ system. And then you have tissues that go through beautiful episodic ebbs and flows of activity and quiescence. So, um, so we thought, okay, these are the cells that keep our tissues alive. They sustain our tissue and health and disease. Um, let's look at the impact of inflammation on these cells and are there any changes to how these cells behave? And so we, we decided to use a really well-established model of inflammation that models sort of psoriasis like inflammation. And the reason we chose this model is not just because it was super well-defined, but if you topically apply the TLR agonist imico mode for seven days, you get this really nice inflammatory response, which you can see here. Um, it's super well defined. It's a type 17 inflammatory response. You get epidermal hyperplasia. But for our purposes and the purposes of this question about what happens after inflammation, what you could see very clearly uh, was that at day 30, the tissue went back to its homeostatic baseline and that you didn't really have any lingering chronic effects. And so now we could ask, what happens during and what happens after. So Sam and I spent a lot of time um, sort of analyzing the post-inflamed tissue, this day 30 tissue, and we didn't see dramatic changes in any of the inflammatory transcription factors or signals. And we were about to give up when we decided to say, okay, well, let's, let's challenge this tissue. 
that has experienced inflammation um, and ask the stem cells to do what they do best, which is make new tissue, heal wounds. Um, and so we did just that. So this time we either gave them ice incremote or, or vehicle, let them resolve, and then challenge them with a with a full thickness punch biopsy, which looks like this, and, and just look at how this wound healed. And you can see just macroscopically that there were there was a clear advantage that the inflammation experienced skin had. And this advantage was observed even up to 180 days after that initial mode response, really telling us that this is an enduring change that's occurring. So, so between this and this, I'm going to cut, make a long story short, and say we depleted uh, various innate and adaptive immune cells. And although the immune response, although the healing response was dampened, the post-inflamed skin always had an advantage over the control skin. And so, that, what that told us was it wasn't just immunological changes that were occurring, but there were changes in non-immune cells. And so, we decided we would focus in on the epithelial progenitors, um, and really took a um, took a cue from the trained immunity field, um, which basically has described this phenomenon that's been known for a very long time, but mechanistically, which is that when you have innate immune cells that have never seen a, a stimuli before, and they see a stimuli, they respond to that stimuli. And even when that stimuli is removed, in this case, microbe, you have some kind of magical epigenetic modification that um, alters the functional state of these cells and entrains them in a way that when they see a secondary stimuli, whether it's the same or different, they now respond very differently. And that's kind of what we were seeing, which is you had a naive quote unquote epithelial cell, you gave it imic mode, and then through some magic in the middle, uh, you had a resolution and a change in the functionality, which I'm gonna describe mechanistically next, um, and then when you came with the secondary trigger, the stem cell now responded very, very differently and was healing wounds faster. So we wondered what are this intrinsic changes that occur to stem cells post-inflammation and how may they be conferring a repair advantage in this, in this context? And so to do this, um, we used an assay called ATAC-seq, uh, which essentially allows us to look at accessible versus inaccessible chromatin. So what parts of the DNA are open uh, and what are not. Um, and so we purified our epithelial progenitors and succumbed them to this assay. And I'm just going to show you summarized plots of all open accessible regions in various conditions. So you can see that at the peak of inflammation, and the red is the immoco mode or post-inflamed, and the light gray is the control, and the dark gray is the shared. Um, so during inflammation, of course, there are a lot of unique and dramatic changes to the epigenome and accessibility. It's a pathological situation. But post-inflammation, despite the fact that the tissue goes back to looking like it's homeostatic and it's at a baseline level, you see that a small but significant portion of accessibility loci are maintained, um, and they're maintained long term, so for 180 days out. So these, the emico mode and the control circles never go back to overlapping. And if you look at what pathways are enriched, it's it's really pathways associated with stress and inflammation. Um, so that really gave us this model, which is. Um, how we thought things were working that we needed to test. Um, and that that really was that when you have a naive stem progenitor cell and that stem progenitor cell sees an inflammatory trigger, um, it opens up accessibility of its genes, has this whole transcriptional program that drives pathology. And then upon resolution, the tissue goes back to baseline, but the accessibility of these inflammatory genes don't go back to baseline. They're maintained and that may potentially be conferring an advantage that allows for a more rapid secondary response. So we did test two key parts of this, um, which was are our accessibility loci that are maintained, or memory quote unquote loci, actually functional or are they just open pieces of DNA? And if they are indeed functional, how are they uh, contributing to the enhanced repair phenotype? So to address the first, we devised this assay where we took our quote unquote memory peaks, so regions that we knew were accessible in post-inflamed skin, uh, post-inflamed epithelial progenitors, and cloned it in front of a GFP with a minimal promoter. 
Um, and so essentially if our peak is functioning and able to drive gene expression, then we'll see green in whatever cells we assay this in. And we also had a constitutive RFP to make sure that our, our vector that we're gonna use to express this memory peak was in fact functional and infected. And we packaged this into a lentivirus and we injected it into embryos at embryonic day 9.5. Now, what's really interesting about lentiviruses is they infect the very first cell they see and at embryonic day 9.5, that very first cell happens to be an epithelial progenitor because that's when the epithelia are specified. So that really allows us to do um, in vivo genetic manipulations in epithelial progenitors quite rapidly. And what you can see is our various, we, we picked about six different peaks. Um, our, our various infections work really, really well in the epidermis. We get epidermal specific um, expression. Um, of our vector and, and um, you see a lot of red, but you don't really see a lot of green. And that's quite surprising um, because our, this is an assay for if our memory peaks are functional. But then when you give inflammation, suddenly the green turns on. And I think this was really exciting because it told us two things. One, that these memory domains that we see are capable of driving gene expression. And two, they do so in a very context specific manner. So only when there's the right inflammatory cue. And that kind of explained why, despite the fact that these loci were accessible, you weren't seeing pathology because the right context was not there. And then when you had a secondary wound, that context was provided. Um, and so this was exciting. And so we wanted to delve in deeper into, well, okay, what are the genes that these memory loci are driving? And how are they enhancing wound repair? So here we, we stuck to a um, transcriptomics approach and a bulk transcriptomics approach. Um, I know that's old school, but I love bulk transcriptomics and I always like to put in a pitch for it. Um, and so when you look at the peak of inflammation, you see all these dramatic changes in the epithelial stem cells. Um, and that makes sense. Again, it's an inflammatory response. It's a huge amount of pathology. Then we look at the resolved state. So day 30 post-inflammation, and you see that there's not that many differences in the transcripts between post-inflamed stem cells and control stem cells. By contrast, the, the ataxy data really revealed that about 11,000 loci were differentially expressed. So, so uh, what you see at the transcript level is not reflected in the, in the memory peaks at this hard point. Um, but if you give a secondary stimuli, in this case, our wound, what you see is a small but significant portion of memory-associated um, transcripts are rapidly upregulated. So this was quite interesting. And we wondered, what are these memory transcripts that are upregulated and how are they conferring a wound healing advantage? So we essentially took these transcripts and did a pathways analysis. And the thing that really popped out to us was this inflammasome pathway and in 2 particularly because it was also enriched in the resolve um, epithelial progenitors. And so when you, we wondered, is this a key effector of memory in this context? And so when you want to know what something does, you take it away. So we looked at our AIM2 knockouts and um, you can see that post-inflamed advantage is entirely ablated in the AIM2 knockouts. Now the AIM2 knockouts were global knockouts. They weren't tissue specific knockouts. So to essentially mimic the the memory effect, we decided to do an epithelial specific aim to gain of function, essentially mimicking that sort of memorized epithelia. So this time, instead of packaging a reporter into our lentivirus, we packaged an inducible aim to cDNA. Um, and, and indeed, you can overexpress aim to 200 fold here. And when you do that, and then you wound the skin, you see that you're able to recapitulate that wound healing advantage just by heightening aim to expression levels in epithelial progenitors. So I think what this told us was that um, our tissues are not static. And I think we've known this as, um, as immunologists, but I think you know our folks that study stem cell biology have really looked at stem cells as these units of um, building blocks of tissues that get homeostatic clues or wound clues. And we're realizing that even those states of responsiveness within tissue stem cells are quite dynamic. 
and train stem cells. Here we've shown through AIM2 and in data that I didn't show you through cas one and L1 beta, um, mediate an adaptive response. So in this case, wound healing. I'm an optimist, so I like to focus on the positive. Um, and subsequently, there have been several studies showing how similar training occurs in hematopoietic stem cells and in mucosal intestinal stem cells that also mediate adaptive responses to pathogens. Um, but everything that's good can go bad. And so there's certainly been evidence that maladaptive responses are also a consequence of this heightened sensitivity to stem cells and this heightened responsiveness, certainly in autoimmunity, but also in their predisposition to cancer and, and more recently in long COVID. Um, and so I think this duality is something that we're really actively working on, which is um, how do you look at training programs across tissues and long-lived cells? And, and how do we modulate these programs to promote health and mitigate disease? But finally, I want to tell you about some of the stuff that we've been doing in my lab uh, more recently, which is sort of returning to this idea of homeostatic immunity that we know is induced by commensal microbes and that surveils the tissue. And, and of course, we know that these homeostatic uh, immune cells not only keep commensals at bay, but also penetrating pathogens. And we wondered, well, they're hanging out of the barriers. So uh, do they also participate in, in injury and damage responses? And it became, you know, it became pretty clear that when we say homeostatic immunity, that's a very, very large compendium of cell types. And so we wanted to focus on essentially lymphocytes in a large part because lymphocytes dominantly surveil the skin. Um, they are really, really um, evident and present there, even in health. So this is healthy skin and they're really around the hair follicle. And you can see that there's many, many subsets of both um, uh, CD4s and CD8s that are, and, and they cluster together beautifully. Um, and so, and they've, they've actually been described for a very long time. The first description of lymphocytes in skin was in 1949. And they, and this appreciation for their presence in skin was um, once again resurfaced with Rachel Clark reporting, estimating uh, about 20 billion T cells live in our skin and surveil our skin. And we now know that it's more than just classical alpha beta T cells. There's also a number of innate like lymphocytes that live there. So um, two fantastic postdoctoral fellows, Dr. Peter Kanyajki, Dr. Yue Zing, and a wonderful bioinformatician, Ikjat Sidhu, decided that we're gonna take on this question and ask, how do skin lymphocyte populations respond to acute injury? And and how do they, if they, if they do, how do they participate in the repair response? What's the mechanism? Um, and so they started by taking a pretty agnostic approach, which was just first figuring out what are the changes in lymphocyte populations post wounding. And so they use CyteSeq, essentially a single cell RNA technique that also allows you to measure protein levels on the surface of cells. And this was really crucial because it allowed us to annotate our cells really, really well. It's very hard to discriminate different types of uh, lymphocyte populations without this protein based annotation. And so we looked at unwounded skin, which we've called control here, as well as rapidly after wounding day three and day five. And what you can see is that in contrast to, for instance, a classical infection response where you have an outgrowth of one or two subsets of cells, in wounding, you have a dramatic remodeling of many, many different populations. So it's not one population that's going out or two, but multiple populations that are dynamically changing. Uh, but one trend that seemed pretty common amongst the populations that were enriching in wounds was the presence of type 17 effectors as marked by um, the R gamma T and IL-17 and IL-22. So we first wanted to start by confirming this was indeed the case at the protein level. And so we looked at both murine and human wounds um, and in collaboration with our, you know, our wonderful collaborator at Karolinska, Dr. Zoo Landon. Um, and you see that here in green, both in murine human wounds at the wound front, you see these um, type 17 cells are clearly enriched. And so once again, when you wanna know what something does, you take it away and that's what we did in multiple different ways. And you see that uh, mice lacking type 17 cells or RRC deficient mites have a profound defect in wounds. 
So when I say wound repair, wound repair is a really complicated process, but the facet of wound repair that we're most interested in is this process called reepithelialization or um, making new epithelial tissue, which progenitors at the wound's edge multiply. So they're making more of themselves and then migrate to seal the denuded tissue and make new, um, the new tissue. And they have to do this in a really harsh environment um, that's hypoxic, that's filled with microbes. And, and we think that this migrating wound edge is really critical to study because it's actually a potent source of androgenic neurotropic and immunostimulatory factors that draw in the rest of the tissue. So, so we wondered if this critical facet of wound repair was perturbed in the absence of type 17 cells. And indeed, so we measured this using um, intracrine alpha-5, which is an intracrine um, that's expressed by this migrating wound front, so the newly forming tissue. And you saw that this was in fact um, hampered in the absence of type 17 cells. And here I really wanna take a minute to highlight some of the beautiful work from the Belcade lab that has also um, had very similar findings when it comes to type 17 cells uh, from both John Linehan and Oliver Harrison. Um, and so we wondered which of our subsets, um, which of our many subsets that had now been outgrowing were playing a role in this process. And of course, this was right when COVID hit. So we had to contract our animal colonies drastically and take a bit of a different approach. Um, so we thought, wound healing is spatially regulated. Why don't we use a sort of location function approach, which is say, the cells that are near the wound's edge are gonna be the ones that are driving this reepithelialization process and the cells that are far away are not. And we couldn't visualize those cells because it's very hard to tell them apart with just immunofluorescence imaging. Um, so we decided to use an omics based approach that would allow us to really nicely localize our many different innate like cell types in the skin. So spatial transcriptomics is a very cool approach. You section your tissues onto these slides that have spatially barcoded microarray beads, and you get these beautiful maps of what tissues look like. And for our purposes, you can see that the wound edge epithelia nicely are distinguished in red and, and segregate into their very own cluster. And so we asked, what are the immune cells? What are the type 17 cells that are near this cluster? Um, and so we essentially did a computational analysis called multimodal integration analysis which I realized is just a fancy word for Venn diagram. Um, so you take your populations from your site seek that are enriched in wounds and spatial transcriptomics that are, are present that map your different sites and look at uh, the top 300 genes that are enriched in each of these populations across each of our spatial locations. And the greater degree of overlap, the higher the enrichment score. And what you get are these beautiful maps of where all your various populations of lymphocytes are in different parts of the tissue. And of course, as I mentioned, we were really interested in what's at the wounded epithelium, uh, which we found were dominantly gamma delta and mate cells. Now you'll notice ILCs are also there by signature, but when we looked at numbers, we found by flow that ILC, that the gamma deltas and mates outnumbered the ILCs a thousand to one. So we decided let's focus on those guys. And so now instead of knocking out 20 different types of T cells, we could knock out just gamma deltas or mates and look at their relative contribution to this migrating reepithelializing tongue. And we found that in fact, in this case, gamma deltas are really critical and mates are dispensable. I suspect though, that because these cells have been shown to have redundancy, that this is more a feature of our animal facility. And, and it's much more likely that th these cells will have redundant function. So I think that's something that we should keep in mind when we think about how cells can compensate for each other. And so to make a long story short, I'll tell you that the gamma deltas were making IL-17, they were locally proliferating, uh, they weren't being drawn in from systemic circulation. And this IL-17 was being directly sensed by the wound edge epithelium, uh, because if you deleted the 17 receptor from the wound edge epithelium, you also recapitulated the gamma delta knockouts and the type 17 deficient knockouts and their inability to make new tissue. So the next question really became, well, how is this wound edge progenitor interpreting 17? And how is it turning on this program of repair. And so to do this, we once again turn to spatial transcriptomics, this time comparing wild type to type 17 deficient wound edges, and really just looking for what are the programs that are different between a healthy, you know, healing wound 
versus one that is in a, unable to turn on this program of reptilization. So we compared differential genes between the well type and GRP knock-ins, which are in fact type 17 knockouts. Um, and what was great was our knockouts are in fact knockouts. It's good to know that IL-17 shows up as one of the key pathways. Uh, but then something surprising came up that we didn't expect. Um, and, and this is one of the delights of omics based approaches is you don't always know what you're gonna get. Um, and so HIP-1 alpha signaling turned up, hypoxia inducible factor one alpha. And we wanted to confirm this at the protein level as well. So you see that HIP-1 alpha, which is a transcription factor, um, is beautifully enriched in the wild type reptilizing wound front. It's in the nucleus. It has this really nice pattern of expression that's notably lacking from mice that don't have type 17 cells. Um, and you see that even the green that is there is not nuclear. There's little speckles that are sort of plastic. So not only was this a um, defect in the transcript, but also a profound defect in the activation and the protein function. And so we first wanted to just confirm that this factor was indeed playing a role in reepithelialization. Um, so we generated mice lacking epidermal HIF-1 alpha. And you see that if you wound them, similar to the R gamma T mice and similar to the type 17 deficient mice um, and the IL-17 receptor deficient mice, um, the HIF-1 alpha mice did not have, also had this wound healing defect and did not have the ability to heal. So, so this was great. So we thought, okay, HIF-1 alpha is a program that's critical for repair. Um, it's a master regulator of repair, clearly. Um, but that doesn't answer why it's differentially expressed in the absence of type 17 cells. Why is this hypoxia inducible one factor, uh, which, which is this remarkable factor that is expressed by all metazoan cells, and in normoxia is uh, constitutively degraded. And when there's hypoxia, cells are able to stabilize HIF and HIF goes into the nucleus and, and turns on all of these programs that allow the cell to survive in this hypoxic environment. Why, why is this factor altered in the absence of um, type 17 cells? And so the obvious sort of thing that we wanted to look at was hypoxia. Is there a difference in the way these wounds are oxygenated? And so we measured hypoxia in two different ways. We used a chemical probe, pimidazole, and a physical fiber optic probe that you stuck into the wound's edge and measured oxygen levels. And this was completely unexpected because in contrast to what we thought would happen, there was no difference in hypoxia between the wild type and the type 17 deficient mice. And so now we're stuck with this intellectual banana peel, which is, why do you have a difference in hypoxia inducible factor in the absence of any difference in hypoxia? That's kind of the opposite of what we expect. And so we wondered, is hypoxia just signal one and is IL-17 signal two? And, and so to test this, we first just did a simple experiment, which is intradermally inject uh, recombinant IL-17A. And you see that IL-17A turns on HIF-1 alpha like gangbusters. And again, this is entirely dependent on the epidermal expression of IL-17 RC or the receptor. So we think it's a direct effect of IL-17 signaling into the epithelia and not some sort of accessory cell type playing an intermediary role there. And we also confirmed this by adapting Hans Clever's intestinal organoid system to the skin and generating epithelial only organoids and then treating them with IL-17. And you can see that in untreated organoids, there's not a lot of HIF going on, but when you give IL-17, one, the organoids were very, very big, um, but two, also you get this robust IL-17 expression, and this is entirely dependent on the expression of the receptor. So the organoid system was also really critical because it would allow us to now probe, how is this happening? How does IL-17A induce HIF-1 alpha? And a priori, I will say that we looked at all the factors that were involved in sort of the acute hypoxia response, uh, like the PhDs and VHLs, and none of their expression was changed. So none of those circuitries were altered. But uh, one of the things that was really showed up in our omics data was mTOR. And so we wondered, is mTOR playing a key role here? Um, and so when you give IL-17A, you did see that mTOR and its downstream kinases were, were really strikingly activated. 
And when you gave rapamycin, which is an inhibitor of TORC1, that completely diminished the HIF1 alpha expression. And for the aficionados, we think this is driven by uh, proximal ERK and AKT signaling downstream of the 17 receptor. And I don't know how AKT is turned on or if PI3 kinase is involved. So I'm just preempting some Twitter questions in advance. Uh, but it, they are intriguing questions. Um, but once again, this tells us how it's happening, not why. So why do you need 17 in the presence of hypoxia? Why is, why is hypoxia not doing this? And so this is where we, we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, well, let's, let's model what a wound is like. It's a chronic hypoxic situation. It takes days and days. And, and so, so maybe the sort of classical hypoxia machinery is no longer critical for maintaining this level of HIF, which needs to sustain adaptation over time. So we took our organoids and exposed them to either normoxia, 21% oxygen, or acute hypoxia for five hours at 2% oxygen, which mimic the wound edge, or five days, the chronic sort of hypoxia that you see over a regenerating tissue. And you see in an acute, in sort of normoxia 17 will induce HIF, not super strikingly, but still there. And in acute hypoxia, um, you're able to induce HIF rapidly. The epithelia do it. This is basically canonical response to hypoxia. Um, and 17 further augments that. But in chronic hypoxia, so days, for reasons we don't understand, mTOR is completely shut down and the HIF response is completely shut down. So you don't get that response at all. And then when you give IL-17, you rescue that response. So this was really gratifying. And, and, and uh, what that told us is that, for, again, for reasons we don't understand, the cells go into this kind of crisis mode and, and um, stop their sort of um, hypoxia responses and are just waiting to get a signal from the surrounding cell. And, and I wanna to touch upon this a bit more later when I talk about the implications of these findings. Um, and, and so this is sort of um, the cell waiting until it gets a 17 signal that licenses to turn on and adapt. So that was really, really um, exciting and interesting. And so we wondered, okay, why do you need HIF then? Like, why, you know, what is this HIF doing and how is it promoting the migration of these cells and how is it promoting um, the healing process? Like, what is the physical contribution of HIF to this process? So we know that HIF is one of the key activators of glycolysis. And indeed, in our various omics analysis, we had found that the absence of type 17 cells, the wound edge reupsizing front was lacking key enzymes for glycolysis in the glycolysis pathway. And we use glucose transporter one as a surrogate readout for glycolysis in vivo. And you saw that in, in the absence of our gamma T cells, epithelial specific IL-17RC knockouts or epithelial specific HIF1 alpha knockouts, that GLUT1 expression was significantly diminished compared to wild type in the re wound front. So what that told us is, that this metabolic switch was happening in the wound front. And it was really dependent on an IL-17 signal turning on HIF-1 alpha. And so um, we confirmed that this was indeed the case functionally, because again, those are just protein expression levels by stimulating organoids with IL-17 and then using the seahorse to measure functional glycolysis. And you can see that the IL-17 simulator organoids here in red um, are, are clearly much more able to engage in glycolytic metabolism and also make a lot more of the terminal end product lactate. So I ha really have to give credit to Dr. Mandy Magigi. Her group was one of the first groups to show that IL-17 in fact turns on glycolysis. Uh, but what the Magigi group had found was that it was real. So they were really studying this in the context of fibroblasts during the induction of an inflammatory response. And the absence of IL-17, um, the fibroblasts never turn on glycolysis and in fact didn't survive their inflammatory environment. And we didn't see a survival phenotype. We What we saw was um, a repair defect, a migration defect. And so we needed to test what this glycolysis program was doing in our context and how there may be really context-specific functions by which IL-17-mediated glycolysis is 
um, allowing cells to adapt to the environment in manners that they need to. So we essentially inhibited glycolysis using 2DG, um, which is a competitive inhibitor of hexokinase. And, and, um, and we topically applied this factor and, and measured wound revitalization. Um, and you can see that there was a dramatic defect in the ability of the epithelia to migrate when they were unable to turn on a program of glycolysis. So, um, and we also, I want to just say, we confirmed this in vitro with epithelial specific migration assays. So this was really glycolysis in the epithelium that was crucial for mediating this effect. So I think what these data told us was um, that, well, first of all, um, your homeostatic immune responses are aiding in repair. They're doing more than just uh, protecting the barrier or ghosting the barrier um, from pathogens, but it, it sort of makes sense that repair responses and antipathogen responses are collaborative. And in fact, it is when from an energy perspective, I think much more effective to rebuild the barrier um, than to continually fight off pathogens. Um, and so I think that this function of IL-17 is a really profound and, and um, critical function that has evolved to maintain barriers. Um, and so um, our data really showed that what's in the skin, and in our case, gamma delta T cells, but I suspect that there's gonna be a lot of redundancy in this based on what, what microbes are in your animal facility. And I think in humans, it'll be a much more broader subset of cells that are providing this function. But these cells proliferate locally and they make IL-17A uh, when there's a wound. Um, they rapidly secrete this factor, which is sensed directly by the epithelium. Um, and I wanna highlight that again, you don't need cells coming in from systemic circulation because if you FDY-720 treat the mice, which is an inhibitor of F1P1, um, you still have this exact proliferation and this repair response. So you don't, you're not, you don't need in that early stage to draw in cells from circulation. So the 17 is sensed by the wound edge epithelium, and um, and um, it really allows these cells to turn on this program that allows them to adapt to their harsh hypoxic environment uh, by turning on metabolism. This metabolism eventually fuels their migration and generation of new tissue. So I guess the, the thought that this really struck up with us is, you know, how do we study cellular adaptation to stress? And, and what is the role of the immune system in facilitating this? And, and when we look at the literature, there are beautiful studies done in vitro, all of the biochemical mechanisms by which hypoxia regulates type 1 alpha have been studied in, in cell culture and, and, and have been really, really informative. But to me, that is really saying the cell is functioning autonomously on its own and mimicking a sort of unicellular process where unicellular organisms are in direct contact with their environment and are able to sense and respond. Or an acute process in which a cell acutely experiences a stressor and is able to respond. I think when we think about the time scale and the complexity of responses that occur in multicellular organisms in processes like wound repair, really thinking about shifting to this model of cooperativity where you need a secondary signal from another cell to license you to keep going forward and adapting. And of course, in my very biased view, I think that secondary cell is going to be an immune cell. Um, to to adapt and buy, to adapt to this um, environment, um, so I think studying what these secondary signals are are going to tell us a lot about how our physiology works, um, and studying a lot of these processes of responding to acute stimuli is going to be really really crucial in understanding um, you know the mechanisms of how physiology occurs and is mediated by. So I'm gonna end there and really just leave you with this notion that immune cells are crucial uh, mediators of sensors and, and actuators of environmental inputs. Um, the conversations between immune cells and non-immune cells today, I spoke to you about largely about the epithelia, but certainly I think we now appreciate that immune cells speak to like every non-immune cell type in the body and every cell in your body has at some point as an immune cell. Um, I think dictate how these um, inputs 
influence health and disease. Uh, what I've shown you today is that microbes and our experience with commensals is really critical for adaptation and barrier fitness and heterologous protection, and that our acute inflammatory encounters um, augment repair um, and do so both in a cell intrinsic manner by, by sort of uh, engaging progenitors and, and helping them um, learn uh, to respond better, but also by this extraneous adaptation through our, our, our homeostatic immune response. Um, but what, what goes up can also go down. And I think one of the things that uh, my lab is now actively looking at is how these same features are co-opted in disease um, and how inflammatory memory could be fueling recurrent inflammatory diseases or cancers and, and how our L17 HIPPON alpha axis is co-opted in 17 mediated pathologies. So I will stop there and I will first thank my amazing lab they are wonderful and it is truly a pleasure to work with and learn from each and every one of them. I will also thank our wonderful collaborators at NYU, uh, Dr. Aris Sirigos, Dr. Cindy Loomis, Dr. Adrian Hege, and I've, I've thanked our collaborators all along the way, but I wanna take a moment to really thank my mentors, particularly my graduate mentors, Dr. Yasmin Belkade and Dr. Julissa Gray. Um, I think it's very rare that as a graduate student, you get to just uh, venture into completely new territory. And it really takes um, a certain type of mentor and a certain type of scientist to support that spirit of adventure. And I, I cannot thank Yasmin enough for um, her tremendous support over the years. Um, and I feel the same exact way about Julissa Gray. She was a pioneer in the skin microbiome field. Both of them were, and it was a pleasure to learn from them. And I also wanna thank my postdoctoral mentor, Dr. Elaine Fuchs, um, who, was once again wonderful and allowed me to pursue this project uh, in immunology that was outside the wheelhouse of the Fuchs lab and, and did so very generously. Um, so I'll stop there and I think I've reached time. Um, I've been I've been trying not to go over. Um, so thank you very much again for hosting me. Ruthi, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for this inspiring and, and fascinating seminar. Um, as it is common for Global Immuno Talks, uh, we do not hear discussed questions, although I do have a couple of pressing ones for you. Um, but what we encourage everyone who is visiting you on YouTube or, or seeing the seminar live is to ask questions via Twitter. Um, and so in, in a couple of days, you will also be able to repeat the seminar because we will, we will post it on YouTube. Um, and so unfortunately, there's always a bit of an abrupt end right now. I wish to thank you on behalf of all the other organizers uh, and, and everyone who's listened to your wonderful talk today for, for joining us today, uh, for the time you spent with us and uh, everybody else uh, at home or in the offices. Uh, a good morning, afternoon, evening, night. And bye-bye, uh, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.